So, um, all right, uh, this is a huge podium, so I hope you can see me. I'm, I'm kind of short. But uh, I wanted to, to uh, welcome our next uh, case study. Uh, from our presentation this morning, Nico shared with you the ecological model, and so we've been hearing a lot of case studies at kind of the national level, the state level, and now we have a, a, a wonderful panelist that's going to talk about a regional tribal uh, level uh, activity that they've been working on. And this is the, the Sioux St. Marie uh, from Michigan tribe of the Chippewa Indians. And um, the, our distinguished panel consists of Jeff Holt, and he is the uh, Sioux tribal leader and has been involved in economic and community development for over 20 years. He's the chairman of the Sioux St. Marie Economic and Development Commission. Then we have Sh uh, Shannon Lang, who is the program coordinator for the tribal health and wellness in the Center for Healthy Communities at the Michigan Public Health Institute. And uh, Donna Norkley is the project coordinator for the Sioux St. Marie Tribe of the Chippewa Indians Community Transformation Grant. Um, so with this distinguished panel, uh, as, as we have in other panels, they'll have about 20 minutes for presentation, and then we'll take a few minutes for, for questions and answers. So I'd like to invite Donna to be our first panelist. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I do, on behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, I want to say that we are honored to be here to present our cross-sector work in reducing the high rates of obesity and other disparities in our service area. Uh, you can see on the slide here that our service area covers the whole eastern half of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, this land area is 8,500 square miles, and in that land area, we only have 179,000 residents. Uh, 40,000, or 14,000, excuse me, 14,000 of those are Sioux Tribe members, and they're interspersed uh, throughout the community. We don't really have a reservation area, per se, um, so our tribal members live, work, and play in our communities, and that's why it was so important for us to connect with the communities, and we were really fortunate to have some funding that allowed us to do that. Um, over the past eight to 10 years, our work really has evolved. We started out with a very small pot of money um, that we got um, through the Steps to a Healthier Anishinaabe project, and with that, we worked primarily in the community of Sault Ste. Marie, um, after that, in 2008, we received funding from the federal funding from the CDC for the Strategic Alliance for Health Project. And so we moved our work then to fork funded communities, Munising, Manistique, St. Ignace, and Sault Ste. Marie. And now, uh, in 2011, we had our Community Transformation Grant Project, and this allowed us to expand into some more rural communities of Kinross and Newberry, and we've also since then partnered with some existing coalitions and partners that are doing the same kind of work as us, and achieve coalition in Marquette County and uh, the Great Start Collaboratives out of Escanaba. Uh, we also have, um, we don't have, we st actually strategically selected a tribal leadership team to oversee our work. So <clears throat> besides the community coalitions, we do have an overarching body of um, tribal key decision makers. And without these decision makers, uh, we couldn't have made the kinds of policy systems and environmental change happen in tribal agencies. These are actually leaders in multi-sector tribal agencies, housing, transportation, economic development, early childhood, youth education, and activities. Um, we do have some challenges because of the broad geographic area and the small no population numbers. And we also have challenges because we have a lot of snow up there. <laughs> um, Where do I advance the slide? Oh, she did. Okay. <laughs> Um, I want to focus 
basically on three initiatives that actually created our greatest success in allowing us to form these coalitions that you saw on the previous slide. Um, when we first started this work, um, the tribe was kind of in isolation. The schools were in their own little silo and local government worked on its own. Nobody really was collaborating, especially um, with the tribe. So we got some funding and we had to approach the schools. We don't have any tribal schools. And so we approached the public schools and said, uh, we have a little bit of money. We did not, we were very careful not to say, you know, we would like you to improve your school lunches or we would like you to offer more PE time. We just said, we would look at this coordinated school health model. We have some money to help you build some capacity and infrastructure for your schools to form coordinated school health teams and complete assessments of your environment. And then you develop an action plan based on what you see at your school. And you tell us what you want to do. And Fortunately, uh, several of our schools selected uh, Safe Routes to School projects as part of their action plan as a way to increase students' physical activity, get them walking and biking to and from school. So then we approached local government. Uh, we saw we needed their buy-in. And with that, we did walking audits, we conducted workshops, and they looked at the infrastructure in the community and at it was amazing how the community, the schools, uh, local government, city engineers, uh, downtown development authority directors, and uh, we brought in two purposely our tribal transportation planner to be part of this. Um, and I think that's really helped uh, reduce some of the disparity that we saw with tribal housing sites, um, tribal health centers, and we have tribal casinos that are the largest employers of tribal members, and they're not connected. There's no connectivity except by dangerous highways with a lot of fast-moving traffic. So we brought in our tribal transportation planner, and a vision was created about, not just about increasing physical activity, but how we could make walkable, bikeable, vibrant communities. And the local government really was more interested in the economic <laughs> advantages of creating walkable, bikeable communities, but it was to our benefit. Um, so, next slide. Uh, we also, this gave us a great opportunity to do some other initiatives with healthy eating um, because we had buy-in and a close connection with our local government we actually uh, implemented with the partnership with the village of Newberry and the city of Manistique, we started two farmers markets. And um, since then, we've started two more in smaller communities. And we also promote all of the farmers markets across our Southern County service area with uh, local, let's eat local campaigns and technical assistance. The next slide is sustainability. We really worked hard to build sustainability into these efforts. Uh, we didn't want to just have a little pot of funding and they do a project and it's gone. And so when we conducted the workshops with the local governments, we convinced them that they should um, adopt complete streets practices and make the communities more walkable and bikeable. So they actually presented to the city councils, village councils, township boards, and we had seven communities now adopt complete streets policies. We had six communities, we came to them with funding and we said, okay, you got a policy, that's great, but how are you gonna implement complete streets practices? So they developed non-motorized transportation plans with our little bit of funding. And then the schools implemented Safe Routes to School and Walk and Bike to School programs. 
And we did that leveraging funding. Our little three, we gave one community, this is a great example, we gave one community $3,000 to develop a non-motorized transportation plan. The village council matched that funding, developed a beautiful non-motorized transportation plan, which the school and the village then used to apply to the Michigan Department of Transportation, and that leveraged $230,000 for construction of sidewalks, shared use paths, and for the school to do some encouragement, education, and enforcement activities to promote, promote walking and biking to school. And you can see on the picture, this is one school that uh, what they did was safe routes funding that we leveraged. They put in a sidewalk and a crosswalk so the kids could safely get to school. Um, I will bow to Shannon. So as the evaluation team lead, I've had the honor and enjoyment of working with Sioux Tribe for nearly a decade to gather data to assess their community environment and measure their population health status and then evaluate the outcomes of this work. And for the past eight years, although we have a really model, we chose this diagram um, to illustrate the model that's been used that best characterizes the way that this project works, which is the Community Coalition Action Theory Model. Um, and although the model appears to be linear, it actually in reality operates um, very um, in iterative cycles. And um, as many of you doing community work knows, it's often two steps forward and maybe a step to the side. Not all the way back, but, but not always moving forward. And so um, it, there's significant effort invested in coalition building over the lifespan of the work and dedicated staff to recruiting and mobilizing community members to do this work, helping establish the infrastructure in the local communities, um, building that capacity, planning and implementing their own strategic plans, evaluating outcomes, and supporting institutionalization of strategies on an ongoing basis. Um, not to be left out in the corner there, the community context, very important. Context is so important. Um, and contextual factors that we see for Sioux Tribe, the sociocultural and political environment, um, the geography, as, as Donna mentioned, the history, um, a broad history that American Indians have experienced in this country, and of course social norms have all heavily influenced the success of this initiative, both successes and challenges. And speaking of context, um, an essential element of success has been um, the collection, and interpretation, prioritization, dissemination, and translation of data to strategies, a process that we call putting data to action. And when we began this work, there were many significant barriers in measurement. Um, there was little data on community environment and on the community context, um, outside of a few settings um, in, in one community, um, Sault Ste. Marie, as Donna mentioned. And for Sioux Tribe, as with many tribes, there was no reliable population level data for obesity-related health, me health measures and social measures. And data available showed wide disparities for tribal members as a whole compared to the state population. But what we didn't know was whether dis disparities existed within the tribal population. And so what, that old saying, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done, we were afraid that health inequities could continue to exist or could worsen if we couldn't measure and monitor disparities with reliability and precision. And importantly, sharing data can be difficult for tribes because data has historically been misused, misconstrued, or misrepresented. Um, and so it's, it's been a challenge. And so most funding, finally, is not structured to support measurement of outcomes over the long term. And therefore, priorities for data collection and measurement had focused on uh, achieving what the funders wanted in terms of meeting their short-term requirements. And we've been slowly working to change that as well to our long-term vision. So over the past eight years, we've collaboratively and systematically worked to improve data. And measurement has truly been about process over product. Um, the product has been good, but the process has been really important. Um, collecting and sharing community assessment data, some of the things that Donna talked about, um, using participatory approaches, as was mentioned earlier, was highly important. It helped simulate synergy for carrying out local action plans. Since 2008, a number of tools, more than 100 assessment tools across the service area have com been completed in different sectors. And the data do show positive increases in measures of the physical environment, the built environment, and food environment. And most important, these data were an integral component of a participatory prioritization and action planning process that local coalitions used on an annual basis. 
In 2013, the tribe successfully completed a population health surveillance survey. And so having scientifically sound tribal population level data is giving the tribe the ability to tailor their strategies to target priority groups and places. Place matters. The health survey data show that wide disparities within the population do exist. The adult obesity rate is different in rural areas, more rural areas. We don't really have urban areas, but <laughs> compared to uh, the urban clusters. Um, and that there are differences in both obesity rates and also physical activity and adult consumption of fruits and vegetables. And so now physical activity and food access strategies can be spread out to the more rural areas in a planful way. And then for the first time, the tribe has representative data for children on daily physical activity, consumption of fruit and vegetables, activity at school, daily screen time, and consumption of junk food and sugar sweetened beverages. These data enable the tribe to conduct long-term planning for prevention of obesity for seven generations by targeting modifiable factors in schools and early childhood programs. Notably, very notably, tribal leadership has been supportive of measurement and evaluation in all ways when protections are put in place, when the work's done in a culturally sensitive way. And in fact, the tribal board unanimously approved a resolution that allows for the sharing of the tribal health data to support the project goals. It's a practice that's not necessarily common in Indian country. And so moving to core features, um, when we look at evaluation data, but more, in talk, more importantly, when we talk um, to community members, coalition members, some of the core features are key drivers. We've heard a lot about leadership. Um, and, when I, and I would just point out that, yes, a strong cross-sectional leadership team, but having a champion um, for each initiative or a champion for the cause, someone that's willing to stick their neck out um, to reach across sectors, um, to create those link linkages, to build this synergy and, and to put themselves out there as sort of the um, person behind something that might, might raise uh, some feathers. Conducting assessment and formative evaluation activities early and often. Um, this is not something you do at the beginning and then evaluate again at the end, um, but using an ongoing basis for strategic planning, data collection that's culturally sensitive and tailored to the local community, and then evaluation that's woven into planning and implementation are critical. Good evaluation ain't cheap, and cheap evaluation is rarely enough. Um, real investment and measurement as a strategy in and of itself is needed. And then regards to community capacity, um, the provision of ongoing capacity building assistance that helps local communities establish infrastructure and leadership in their own community and fosters connections is really important. Um, there's a lot of experts in the field, there's a lot of research, there's evidence-based practices now in this community-based work, but having dedicated staff with real experience on the ground and doing coalition building and strategic planning and community organizing is crucial. And then also as well, coaching and mentoring of these local teams on the creation of the infrastructure and supporting the process along the way. Um, helps to ensure that their early successes help build momentum um, and also long-term sustainability. Thank you. Um, the leadership team has played a, an essential role in the overall success uh, by providing connection to the community uh, and what is happening, really to set an example uh, how to work together across sectors and acting for a conduit uh, communication across sectors. You know, we, we all run into uh, issues and one of the barriers that we engaged was turf issues uh, uh, that came in cross sectors. Uh, uh, leaders of one sector may ask, uh, why is health involved uh, to lead a business or a transportation issue? But one of the lessons we learned was uh, with regard to leadership is to engage all the partners uh, in assessments, prioritization of needs, and decisions about what and how best to carry out the strategies and to address identified needs. As much as possible, we use collaborative process uh, for prioritizing issues. Shared responsibility for actions creates greater buy-in and commitment for over the long term. Uh, when conflicts and priorities became apparent, um, we focused on the data and the facts. We found the common ground we could agree on in order to move forward and left the sensitive issues on the table to tackle later on when more trust was established. We've come a long way and uh, some of the barriers that we ran into were uh, local governments and their red tape and limited resources. We've all heard that. Uh, a zillion times, and uh, that's, we ran into that as well. 
and the schools are overwhelmed. Uh, the teachers and staff uh, lack time and resources to participate in these uh, in a lot of uh, uh, coalitions. Uh, and, and another issue was uh, being Michigan as the car state, uh, public transportation is uh, uh, sorely uh, needed and, uh, and really not, not existing in a lot of our rural communities. Matter of fact, somebody once said there's more cars in the UP than there are people. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I'm guilty of that myself. <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, some of the solutions we use to break down these barriers are focus on building the relationship with key players. Uh, gaining buy-in and support through t taking our resources right to the right to them and forming action teams within their agencies and sustaining commitment and participation by being inclusive of shared priorities and benefits as a tribal community uh, we face many barriers uh, to addressing health disparities and moving forward with health equity uh, since our service area is roughly the size of New Jersey uh, we've got our hands full Prior to this initiative, the tribe in many cases did not have a seat at the table in a lot of the local communities, um, and tribal priorities and needs were not being adequately met. For many years, we lacked their, the internal resources to hire and maintain staff in key positions. Uh, we had difficulty recruiting and hiring qualified personnel in our area. With the community health grants we applied for and were awarded, federal funding made it possible to hire the project coordinator and other community coordinators. Around the same time, the tribe was able to hire a transportation planner to help implement plans that had existed for many years. In addition, there had not been enough open communication and trust established between tribal and non-tribal entities. Lesson learned. Um, over time, the tribe has worked to create formal agreements and relationship with government entities involved or has input in local decision-making processes that affect tribal members. Uh, tribal staff serve on committees, on advisory boards, local units of government uh, that include tribal issues, and meetings on agendas for ongoing collaboration. Now that we are at the table, uh, we can't afford to speak up, and we don't. We don't we're not afraid to. Uh, we do speak up, and this is uh, what we can bring to the table. Um, and uh, a good example of that is uh, who would have thought 30 years ago that local communities will be coming to the tribe now and asking for our assistance, our guidance, our help? Who would have thought uh, 30 years ago? Um, a good example of our, our impact was uh, a few years back, we purchased a 100-year-old schoolhouse in the middle of the UP, and uh, it had been, been vacant for about 20 years. Uh, the tribal chairman came to me and said, do you think you can... Uh, make this into a community center? And I, it was one of those questions where there wasn't a right answer. <laughs> and uh, of course I said yes. And uh, I went up to the site and I thought, oh my God, what, what have we done? <laughs> it was a three-story building and I walked into the main floor and you could see right through to the sky. And there was varmints and, and activities going on in there that uh, I didn't really want to know. Uh, but. Uh, a, year and a year later, uh, the site was completed, and at the ribbon-cutting ceremony, the local elected officials, non-tribal elected officials, called that the cornerstone to their economic development. Uh, you couldn't have, uh, as an economic and community developer, it couldn't have, uh, the praise couldn't have been any higher, and uh, was, was really pleased at the, at the results. Um, the, the building houses uh, community and, and uh, uh, health services, and uh, it also hire, uh, hoses uh, an elder um, facility. Something as simple as a sidewalk in our community leads to uh, increased activity. We've worked with several outlying areas that, uh, for instance, the cities had the labor, but they didn't have the uh, material cost for even building sidewalks. And we provided the material, and they provided the labor. And uh, so it was a it was a win for both for both the uh, the tribe and the uh, and the community. Uh, next slide, please. So who's ever the magic person? <laughs> we're we're a little bit behind here. Sorry about that. Um, you'll see some of the tribal housing site here and uh, uh, our safe routes to school and um, some of our initiatives. Next one, please. Um, in closing. Um, uh, we, um, 
we've proven that community and economic development and health initiatives uh, can and do uh, coexist and collaborate. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure and an honor to speak here. And, uh, um, and oh, by the way, before I forget, Donna, don't forget uh, our, check out our website, Up for Health. Um, I think you'll enjoy looking at that and it kind of gives you more of a detail of what we've done over the past uh, few years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, Donna, and Shannon. Um, I, I had a question for you. We, we've heard a lot about building trust uh, in the communities and how important uh, that is uh, to have successful programs. Uh, what steps went into building a strong relationship with your partner organizations? <laughs> well, as I said before, we were very careful uh, when we approached the community to uh, listen to their needs and say, you know, we have some resources to bring. Uh, we can help you with initiatives you want to do, but we wanted to make sure that they owned the project. And, um, but we did really strategically try to pull in, you know, our key tribal leaders to collaborate on these projects. And I guess the thing I'm really most proud of is uh, we worked with our Sioux Tribe transportation planner and we developed a non-motorized transportation plan that covered the whole seven county service area and basically looked at connectivity with tribal areas to the community. And the community now, the communities that have developed the non-motorized transportation plans actually use the tribal non-motorized transportation plan and incorporate it in their plan. So for the first time now, communities are looking at their budget and how we can collaborate uh, to share resources to get better infrastructure built in the community. Um, and one community, Sault Ste. Marie, actually appointed an, a non-motorized transportation advisory committee to monitor the plan. They adopted the non-motorized transportation plan into the city's master plan appointed this committee and appointed the Sioux Tribe Transportation Planner to sit on that committee. So it's the first time I, that I know of or can remember that, you know, the tribal transportation planner has been part of decision making for the community on what priorities uh, for walking and biking get implemented. Well, uh, as I was sent in my bio, uh, uh, I guess I, I, I'd like to say that uh, involved in economic development, uh, uh, the activities that I get involved in are non, some are non-tribal, and they're non-paying, of course. I have to say that in case there's anybody, any auditors in the room. Um, and uh, uh, we're very pleased, uh, honored to be involved in them, but it gives the tribe a seat at the table uh, and to, to show folks that uh, uh, we are skilled, we, we can do what, what uh, others have done. And, um, and we can offer assistance, and we can offer leadership, and we do. And, um, and that's really what, what, what I'm most proud of, is that uh, we've taken that extra effort in an organization that is, uh, was formed in the mid-70s, um, a little bit of history of our tribe. We are located, a very unique tribe, we're located inside the city limits of Sault Ste. Marie, which by the way, if you follow I-75 and don't go to Florida, uh, we are located right at the end, uh, so if you hit Canada, you've gone too far. And yeah, we sound Canadian. I, yeah, I get it, yeah. um, which is okay. Um, but anyway, we, we're located inside the city limits, and we had to take the city to court in 1978 to get water and sewer connected. It was all around us, and they wouldn't connect water and sewer. That's 1978. Uh, a few of us were around then, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I know Shannon, you weren't, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> But so we've come a long way in, in 35 years, and we're, we're very, very proud of that. Eat at the table, so that's wonderful. Um, Shannon, did you have, want to add anything? Um, I, I guess I would say relationships are really important for evaluators, especially external evaluators. And I get asked a lot about working with tribes and how that works. And I always just tell people, you know, humility. We heard that earlier, but, but go in and watch and really listen. 
um, and try to understand. And if you don't understand, ask very politely and respectfully, but ask, don't assume. Um, and I would just say that being genuine, I mean, when you're, when you're there and you know you're there really about, you know, the work and about um, seeing things through um, for the same goals that they're for, um, people uh, get that from you. They get that vibe off of you. And I think the other thing is it's just been about long-term commitment. Um, we haven't been there just for the life of one grant or another. It's been about, you know, we're here for the long run. So um, I think that's another thing that comes across is, is people knowing that you're committed to seeing it through all the way, not just until a particular funding stream runs out. Thank you. Um, do you all have any plans for uh, expanding or scaling up your program? And is there another sector that you want to bring into the, into the group? Um, yes, we, um, like I said, we have expanded. We went from one community to four funded communities and then with the Community Transformation Grant, we expanded to several more communities, and now um, we have received funding for the Partnerships to Improve Community Health Project, and so we're very excited and hopeful to expand uh, continually across into the, even some of the more western areas where we really haven't done a lot. Um, probably, I don't know the percentage of the population, but most of the tribal population is in the two eastern counties of Chippewa and Mackinac, so uh, that's where we had really focused our activities before, but um, now we're looking at expanding across the whole region and having some initiatives going in all of our counties. We've also worked with 17 school districts across the region to implement some form of coordinated school health and some schools are farther along than others and we hope to keep continuing that and maintaining those efforts. Anybody else want to add? Well, we'll continue um, to provide transportation assistance through our, our roads and, and trail program. Uh, that will never stop. We'll continue to offer services to local uh, communities that might need a cost share or a cooperative agreement, uh, whether it's a $40,000 assistance to build a bridge, um, whether it's $60,000 to expand a, a road uh, or to repair a road, we'll, we'll help with that. Um, and, uh, and in many cases, uh, uh, we don't say no. Uh, we don't like to say no. We, we like to stretch our dollars as far as we can. And uh, we will continue to do that. Thank you. Um, and just one more question, unless there's any in the audience or we haven't gotten any web questions. but. Um, you know, we, we all like to partner with different groups. Uh, were there any groups that you reached out to that decided not to partner with you, or did some groups come and approach you wanting to partner and you knew they may not be a good fit, and how did you handle that? You want to name names? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's from Michigan here. You know that. <laughs> I don't know. I really can't. A lot of people approach you to partner. Think of anybody that hasn't really that we've approached that really hasn't wanted to belong. Um, we've just recently formed a great partnership with our. Um, we started out focusing on our tribal early childhood education program and helping them increase physical activity and improve nutrition and the early childhood sites and. Uh, since then, we've had uh, other, the Great Start Collaboratives, we have three of them that cover our region, a EUP Great Start Collaborative, a Marquette Alger, and then a Delta Menominee. So recently, they have kind of come to the table, and we're starting to expand our efforts with early childhood across our region with non-tribal partners. And anything on terms of social capital and uh, how you built it, uh, how you're growing it, uh, and how it's contributing to your program? Let's just keep going. <laughs> I got nothing. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, that's you, too, that's too, we haven't got another half hour. Um, <laughs> um, well, we, we, when we go into a community, um, uh, we, we now expect the communities to to collaborate with us. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, we would have we would have asked for their assistance or, or their collaboration. Now we we we, we offer uh, a tangible product for them, whether it's money or whether it's assistance or whether it's 
a, a deliverable. We, we offer it and we, and, and we expect them to, to work with us. And in most, in most cases, they do. Uh, uh, so, albeit uh, a little bit hesitant at first, uh, but uh, it doesn't take long for one school district to, to connect with another school district and say, hey, you know what? These folks are, know what they're doing and, 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 they, and they mean business. And uh, so it kind of answers your question, kind of kind of yeah. doesn't. Right. No, and I think, it, you know, a lot has to do with the community trust that you've built, and they know that you all are respectful leaders and, and you take their, um, take into account exact, you know, what they want and how to work with them. So I think you've been a, a wonderful example, and this is a, a group that we don't get to talk about very often, so we really appreciate uh, you being our, in our panel uh, today. So thank you. Let's give them a big hand of applause. Thank you. And uh, actually, we'd like you to stay here, and we'd like all the other presenters to, to uh, come up. And I'm going to introduce David um, Fukuzawa. He's a member of our Roundtable Planning Committee, and he's also the Health Program Director for the Kresge Foundation. And he will facilitate discussion uh, with the audience. So again, thank you all very much. <laughs>